Hey everyone, this is the last video in a series dedicated to the topic whether it's possible to shed vaccinal material in the form of the spike protein itself, which we'll talk about what can we learn about exosomes with spike protein from COVID-19 patients and whether these exosomes can be immunogenic, meaning whether they can stimulate the immune system. Once again, recall exosomes are tiny fragments of cells released by the cells that were infected by the virus and these exosomes can carry spike protein. All right, so my name is Dr. Mikola Rashik of Neurogenomics and let's get started. <laughs> okay, so today I'll present a couple pieces of information. First one is just an abstract. So what does that mean? It means it's not actually published paper, it's only abstract that was available. Most likely it means it was a study that was only presented at a conference, has never been published yet, but the abstract was available. And let's start with conclusion. And the conclusion was that exosomes carrying spike protein could be isolated with COVID-19 patients and these exosomes were indeed immunogenic, meaning they were able to activate and stimulate immune system. So, more interesting now, though, let's get into details. <laughs> and <laughs> if you're wondering why, there's a little, little hill <laughs> and why, why that sound. Uh, so basically, uh, the authors of this abstract, they were looking at lung, lung transplant patients, 60 some of them, who unfortunately were infected with SARS-CoV-2 virus and they isolated exosomes from these patients and they were able to confirm that these exosomes did carry spike protein. More specifically, they mentioned that this, the spike protein was S2 domain. So very quickly remember, spike protein has two domains called S1 and S2. S1 domain is the top of the spike protein, the one that interacts with R receptors, ACE2 receptors on, on the surface of our cells, that domain gets eventually ripped off. And through that interaction with ACE2 receptor, and that exposes the S2 domain, which is basically houses tiny robotic arms of the spike protein. These robotic arms then unfold, grab the cell, adjacent cell, and this is how the virus actually gains entry into the cell that it will infect. Super incredible molecular engineering. So, <laughs> right, so that, so they were able to show that these exosomes from those lung patients carried S2 domain. So there's that. Oh, I apologize for the wind. I'll pause for a second. Might as well give you a view <laughs> while we wait for the wind to pass. And they took those exosomes and they exposed them to mice. And they were able to show, it goes another little hill, and they're able to show woo, <laughs> that the, the mice were able to produce both the antibodies against spike protein when, when, after exposure to these exosomes, number one. And number two, they also were able to activate T cells. We'll talk about more about that in just a moment. All right, so now let's go back to the really, gotta switch my arms, really main topic of the day, the main paper of the day, phenomenal, super cool paper. Again, the summary is that COVID-19 patients were releasing exosomes with spike protein in them. And once again, those, spike, those exosomes were immunogenic. So let's get into a lot of details because this was a really, really cool study. So in this case, the authors looked at healthy controls, so people who are not infected, people with mild COVID-19, so mild symptoms only, and people who had severe COVID-19, okay? So they were isolating the exosomes from these 
groups of patients or controls and they were able to show that the carried spike protein but it showed some surprises so what are the surprises the big one was that the exosomes isolated from patients who had mild COVID-19 actually carried more spike protein and we're talking about way way more spike protein so as that's might be surprising in the context of everything we were talking about and the way they were, they were able to show this was phenomenal so I really want to get into details of that so this is what they did they took latex beads basically tiny little balls made of latex and they attached antibodies on these latex beads against a specific exosome proteins okay so remember exosomes carry their own marker proteins their own unique uh, specific proteins and this is how you can identify exosomes as well so they use these antibodies to be able to find these exosomes specifically and then they took the exosomes from mild patients or severe patients they exposed them to these beads and then basically exosomes were attaching themselves all over those beads then what they did is they took an antibody that they took antibodies that were binding spike proteins and they exposed these exosomes that were attached to those beads to those anti-spike antibody and then they use the second antibody that was recognizing the anti-spike antibody and that secondary antibody had a fluorescent molecule attached to it which would allow you to visualize basically where this, those spike proteins are and remember why the antibodies they have this y shape right so if you look at the letter y the tips of y the top of the letter y would be the components that recognize the antigen basically the protein of interest in this case the spike protein and then the letter y has a stock right so the secondary antibodies recognize this stock it's called fc component and that's what they, they were the secondary are recognizing and they were able to show they use a specialized microscopy that had super high sensitivity like very very just ultra ultra precise down to nanometer level of recognition and they're clearly able to show that the beads that were coated with exosomes from mild patients showed way more fluorescence so way more spike protein okay very very interesting so then they also did the electron microscopy so we've been showing you number of images of electron microscopy so let's get into the details and once again same technique they used two antibodies one antibody was against the spike protein and then they use a secondary antibody that was recognizing the anti-spike antibody but the secondary antibody wasn't attached to a fluorescent molecule it was attached to a tiny little gold particle so remember how do how does electron microscopy work well in electron microscopy you shoot a beam of electrons at a target of interest and then electrons bounce off and leave a shadow and you see this that's what allows you to take photographs on a on this microscopic level of what you're seeing so clearly where they're seeing the spike protein what they're really what the electrons are bouncing off are these tiny little gold particles they're very small they're five nanometers in diameter so so super tiny and uh, and you're visualizing the spike protein by actually visualizing the gold particles reflecting the electron electrons basically so and once again they were able to show that exosomes from mild COVID-19 patients had more spike protein 
than those with severe disease. <laughs> what I liked in those images is that <laughs> that it looks like a the exosome that they chose to show looks like a smiley face. So yeah, I enjoyed that. <laughs> okay, so that's your electron microscopy confirming that again. And the last experiment was by far the coolest. Once again, they used those beads with exosomes attached to it. But again, they used a type of fluorescent microscopy that was ultra precise. And this allowed to see down to a single protein molecule level. And they were able to show how the exosomes from mild COVID-19 patients were decorated with spike proteins. And in this time, everywhere you saw fluorescence, that's where you actually seeing individual spike proteins on the surface of these exosomes. Just incredible images. I've never seen that. I've never seen that technology used before. So I found this fascinating. Absolutely fascinating, very cool. You can actually see how the spike proteins are distributed on the surface of exosomes. So cool, really, really blew my mind. Mm, very pretty. Gonna turn around just to show you where, where I we're heading for an advent, daily adventure. And listen, it might be a little bit counterintuitive as to why would exosomes from mild COVID-19 patients have more spike protein than those of severe patients. Recall that in the last video, we talked about that exosomes with spike proteins that are circulating for a long period of time are linked with COVID-19, a long COVID, long COVID condition. And these can circulate for super long time. And in, in that previous studies in the last video that I was discussing, I didn't mention this, but it's worth mentioning. They were able to see those exosomes circulating, the oh, sorry, I should say spike protein circulating in the blood for up to even a year, a whole year. No one actually knows yet how is it possible that, that spike proteins as well as the virus genetic material can be left behind for so long, that's actually unknown, because the, the longest, I never made a video but on this topic, but the longest period of time that ever, so far ever demonstrated where the virus genetic material can be found in circulating in the body was seven months, and here's spike protein now, even a year. So that's still a mystery. One suggestion, and we made a video on this, was that perhaps Sometimes the SARS-CoV-2 virus can integrate into our genome and there's been some evidence for that, but that has been disputed. So this is controversial information. So not something that we can consider as, uh, as a fact. So with science, you never think of science as, as facts until you have enough of body of evidence, okay? And that's how science works. You have lots and lots of contradiction. So if anyone tells you science says this, remember the big question is, well, how much evidence is there to support this? Because it's very common to have contradictions in science. It actually happens all the time, all the time. All right, so back to, back to my main point with the mild COVID patients exosomes. And the author suspected that perhaps the presence of all that spike protein might be helping these patients in recovery. And they wanted to test that hypothesis. As good scientists, they have hypothesis, they will test it, right? And they're thinking maybe what's happening, these exosomes from mild COVID patients happen to help the stimulation of the immune system, but it might not be happening with the exosomes from the severe COVID-19 patients, at least not to the same degree. So they did test that. And first they wanted to see where do those exosomes actually come from? Remember I was mentioning that you can assess the types of proteins found on the surface of exosomes and it can actually tell you information with regards to, hey, <laughs> where, where do these exosomes come from? So they use antibodies to start probing what is on the surface 
of these exosomes from mild COVID-19 patients. And they were able, based on the proteins that they were able to assess, they found out that these exosomes from the mild COVID-19 patients came from B cells, dendritic cells, monocytes, and macrophages, all of which are antigen presenting cells. So what are antigen presenting cells? Those are cells that actually present fragments of pathogen to the immune system so that the immune system can be activated and start recognizing that pathogen and then whoop its ass once it's infect, infects us again. Basically, that's how it's, uh, it works in a condensed summary. <laughs> All right, so that's how antigen presenting cells work. So clearly, these exosomes come from these type of cells and sometimes exosomes can still retain the same cell functions as the actual cells that they come from. So the authors wanted to know, hey, do these cells, sorry, do these exosomes still can present antigens to, to the immune system? And the way it works is that you want antigen, present, uh, antigen presenting cells to activate helper T cells. These are also called CD4 plus T cells. They're very important. The reason why they're important is because you need to activate helper T cells in order for those to later on be able to help activate B cells, which will then be allow B cells to, to produce antibodies that against the virus. So what they did is they took the exosomes from both mild COVID-19 patients and those with severe COVID-19 and they exposed them to T cells, their own T cells actually. And they wanted to see whether these T cells, CD4 plus or helper T cells are activated and they will start proliferating, meaning they will start growing uh, in number because that's what you want to see in during natural infection and, uh, and stimulation of the immune system. Right, because you obviously want to produce a response to a pathogen. And they were able to show that indeed they did see activation and expansion a number or growth of T cells. And it was much greater, or it was basically that response was bigger when T cells were exposed to mild COVID-19 exosomes than when they were exposed to those from sev sev exosomes from severe COVID-19 patients. So that seems to be supporting that hypothesis. But how do those T cells work in terms of being activated? Well, they have receptors on their cell surface that recognizes a fragment of a pathogen and that allows them to be activated. So Hence, antigen-presenting cells activate T cells by presenting fragment of a pathogen to these T cells. And these receptors on the surface of these T cells are called major histocompatibility complex type 2. And we all have our own unique array of these receptors. So it's based on your personal genetics, what kind of array and what kind of receptors you will have and what kind of basically pathogen fragments you'll be recognizing. So there's some diversity between all of us, some diversity. And what the authors did is they use antibodies that actually block access to those receptors. And they wanted to see if they block access to these receptors, whether they will see activation of T cells and their expansion and indeed this blockade prevented the exosomes from stimulating those T cells to grow in number. So clearly this activation from exosomes is via interaction with that major histocompatibility complex on the, on the T cells. So clearly these exosomes themselves act in a fashion of antigen presenting cells. So the, super, super interesting. This basically is another supporting evidence that exosomes with a spike protein can be immunogenic. Okay, so the last thing the authors did is they wanted to then 
study the proteins on these exosomes in greater detail. So there are techniques that allow you to basically assess what kind of proteins are present. Ah, I dropped my pole again. <laughs> I was trying so hard to stay clean in this video without dropping my pole. Nope, failed. All right, so you can assess the protein cargo and they're able to show that overall they looked at exosomes in healthy individual individuals so that acted as a control and again people with mild and severe disease overall they were able to find 130 different proteins being carried by these exosomes so you can see how complex these little guys can be now amongst all of them 45 of these proteins were unique between those different groups and they focused on 22 of them that were present in the largest amount, those unique ones. 16 of them were unique to the mild COVID-19 exosomes and six of them were unique to the severe COVID-19 exosomes. And basically the take home message is that the proteins in mild exosomes were involved, are the type of proteins that are involved in immune system activation. They are involved in antigen presentation and activation of antigen presenting cells as well. So clearly supporting what, what they've been discovering thus far, right? Whereas those, those proteins from severe exosomes, they were predominantly involved in, in inflammatory response as well as um, stress response overall, as well as complex uh, activation. Um, so, which is also inflammatory. So basically that supports the uh, other studies as, as well, okay? So clearly these exosomes from mild versus severe disease can be very different and they not and not surprising that might have helped to explain why why they will have different biological consequences all right that brings finally brings me to the end of this long series about whether it's possible to shed vaccine material so let's summarize this very briefly here comes the summary gotta switch my hands <clears throat> and number one, there's supporting evidence that exosomes can be breathed out. So they can, be, they can be present in your breath and basically you are breathing out, breathing them out in your environment. Number two, clearly exosomes can carry spike protein. There's tons of evidence or a lot of evidence uh, when it comes to COVID-19 patients and limited evidence when it comes to vaccinated individuals. The reason why is because it seems like no scientists want to touch this topic at the moment. I don't know why. Not a popular topic. Okay, so be it. I'm sure we will study it in, in greater detail in the future though. And then number three, the exosomes carrying spike protein can stimulate the immune system. And number four, unvaccinated children of vaccinated parents can be passively immunized in an unknown ma manner that we still yet have to find out how this might be happening. So what is my verdict overall? Or I should say, what is the big unknown? The big question remaining is, is it possible to breathe out exosomes carrying spike protein. Because if that was possible, this would actually constitute shedding. And in the big verdict then, so we have to find out, that still has to be studied. And then my big verdict is that overall, with the scientific evidence presented so far, it is feasible and possible that shedding 
of spike protein via breath could be possible, but we do have to study this and confirm, including obviously shedding of vaccinal material via spike protein. And do, and I think this is very urgent that we actually st study this and find out if this is possible and true or not. But the, all of the evidence that I've been presenting in this last video series suggests that this is not unreasonable to think that this could actually be feasible. All right, so this finally brings me to the conclusion, to the end. So at this moment, I wanted to say, hey, first of all, before I forget, because I always do, thank you for everyone who has donated. It's greatly appreciated. I always forget to say thank you, but it is greatly appreciated. And I can tell you that money goes to support in the making of the videos because it, I actually use that money to Basically, it's extra money I have to pay other people. <laughs> it's as simple as that. Thank you for helping me grow the channel. So that's obviously through sharing videos so that we can grab more subscribers and that helps obviously the, having these videos seen by more people. So thank you, thank you. Thanks for all your likes. Thanks for all the comments. Partially that's these comments as well as Attendance to our COVID Q&A sessions. This is what steers some of the science that we're presenting. So thanks for that. And we're gonna wrap it up here. Last final look around of this beautiful area. And I look forward to seeing you in another video installment in the future. Bye everyone. Oh, and hey, stay active. Go outdoors as much as you can. Clearly, clearly that's my biggest message. Uh, the nature, Mother Nature is my favorite therapist. <laughs> Bye everyone. <laughs>